This is how to install a four foot fence using five foot stakes. The posts are called garden posts or T posts and the fencing material is called welded wire and I'll talk more about all of that after I show you the installation. You can start by marking the line along which you want to run your fence. That is of course assuming that you want to follow a property line or you want to keep your fence straight. If you don't care about either of those things then you can skip this step and you could head straight to marking your fence posts every four to six feet apart. The instructions will tell you to go every four feet but you can get away with up to six feet depending on how sturdy you need your fence to be. Mine is just keeping my dog in. It's more of a psychological barrier than anything so I went every six feet. Initially you can set your post by hand and then you can drive it in using one of these things. This is typically referred to as a garden post driver or a tee post driver and there are several of these available on the market. You basically need the cheapest and lightest version available and that's plenty sufficient to drive your posts in, especially when the ground is soft like it is during the spring. You want to bury the post one foot deep so the top of the flag is barely visible above the dirt. Don't do this. can't even hit it. The point I'm trying to make is go ahead and buy one of these post drivers. They're not that expensive and in my case they saved me a lot of time and potential embarrassment and injury. So here are all of my posts spaced out six feet apart and you'll notice that even though they're going up an incline grade they're all perfectly straight up and down. If you have two people working together you can have one person holding the level and the other one driving the post in and here I am proving a point that even just by yourself, you can still kind of do it. It's not perfect, but it works. That's a level stake. Unrolling the fence material is the part that I found to be the trickiest. I wasn't able to work any more than two or three lengths at a time because the fence material gets pretty unwieldy and just difficult to manage once it's unrolled. It's easiest to unroll on the ground and then stand it up into place. But then once you get it up into place, you kind of have to walk it forward as you're unrolling it. And these rolls are pretty heavy. So, uh, you know, you just have to kind of work with it. Here I'm clamping the fence material into place on the posts temporarily before I can fasten it permanently, which I will show you in just a minute. So you notice the stakes have these tabs on them. And theoretically, these tabs would line up with all the cross wires of the fence. You would slide the fence kind of down into the tabs. You would smash the tab shut and it would hold the fence in place. But that's not how it really works in the real world because you've got changes in elevation or you might not have put all the stakes in at exactly the right height and they're just not going to line up. So what I do is I take these. Uh, these are post uh, wire clamp thingies. They're called post fasteners. And this is what they look like when they're installed. In the top. I put the fence material on the back of the post and then the fastener slips underneath the tab and then the fastener itself has a couple tabs on it. One slips around the back of the fence wire and then the other one slips over the top of the fence wire. Little pliers help do the job and then I crimp it down into place so that it's secure. You want about three of these fasteners per post, distributed evenly top, middle, and bottom, basically as close as you can get to the top and then to the bottom, wherever there's a tab within proximity of a crossing wire. These lined up perfectly because they were right kind of at the hook part of, uh, of the fastener, but sometimes you do have to wrap it around a couple times to make it a snug connection. Or, if you don't want to mess with any of that, another option is zip ties. Basically the same principle here, top, middle, and bottom. Find a nearest tab, slip the zip tie into it, tie it as tight as you can around the back of the fence, and then you may just have to kind of smash that tab on the other side so that uh, the zip tie doesn't slide out of it up or down. Zip ties, of course, are not as strong and potentially prone to breaking, but this is not the type of fence that's going to withstand a lot of weight anyway. When you're ready to stretch to the next post, just put a little bit of tension on the fence to take out any of the slack and then you can re-secure it with these temporary clamps before you fasten it in place permanently. When you get to a corner, you don't even have to make any cuts. You can basically just wrap the fence around it and then keep on going. 
this is called welded wire because every one of these connections is actually a weld. Everywhere that the fence wire crosses itself and makes contact, there's a little tack weld there. And I have to keep my finger in the shot, otherwise it's not gonna focus on it. Uh, whereas a chain link fence or a chicken wire fence, this would actually wrap around itself or twist around itself. It would kind of come in this direction, twist, and then go back down this direction. The result is this type of connection is not quite as strong and it will break if you pull it hard enough. The reason I like this over a chicken wire or a chain link fence is I think it's the easiest to work with. Chicken wire has a lot of smaller uh, kind of grid pattern and it's, uh, it's a lot more complicated to tie together, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Chain link is a heavier gauge and it's just harder to work with when you're an amateur, you know, like myself. And this is especially true when you get a change in terrain. If the ground starts to slope up, you'll get a wave at the top of the fence. If the ground starts to slope down, you'll get a wave at the bottom of the fence. So what do you do when there's a change in terrain? With welded wire, you can actually make a partial cut in the middle of the fence, change the angle, and then stitch it back together again. Now these kinds of fixes will not hold up against an 800 pound hog or the zombie apocalypse, but again, that's not what this type of fence is designed for. They will fence in your dog or your pool or your roving toddler. So here's a part of my fence with a pretty pronounced wave in it where the ground changes direction. So we're gonna cut it about three quarters of the way down and then we'll stitch it back together to take out that wave. And you can see that I'm cutting right in the middle of the wire so that I leave a little bit of wire on either side so that I can stitch it back together. I'm not cutting right at the intersection of the two wires. And this is essentially the same process whether you're changing the angle on your fence to take out a wave or you've reached the end of one roll and you're trying to join it to a new roll of fencing. I basically make little hooks at the end of the wire that I just recently cut and then I'll pull it back together and I'll kind of see where they all make contact and then I'll start crimping them back together again. And now here at the bottom I've left four wires uncut and I'm putting a little kink in them so that when I pull this thing together, there's not a bulge at the bottom and it just comes together more easily. It's by no means an exact science. You kind of have to see where everything naturally makes contact and find the nearest vertical to wrap the horizontal wire around. And the important thing here is pay attention to where the welds are positioned because you don't want to pull away from a weld. You want to always be curling toward a weld if possible so that uh, you don't pull it apart. All right, so here's the progress so far. I've got these top two cinched up and working our way down the next two Good contact. And now as we get to number four, this is where some of the drawbacks of this welded wire come into play because I actually lost my, my weld here. It actually came apart, which can happen. But I was having trouble spanning that gap anyway. So I just, I pulled it back and wrapped it against one of the wires that went vertically. It's one I've kind of wang jangled it a little bit uh, because both of those curls, those hooks were kind of floating out in no man's land and they didn't have a vertical wire to connect to. Uh, so I just kind of went uh, along the horizontal. There's my weld there and I don't want to break it. So I'm being careful not to wrap this one back too hard. Here, I've got an ideal scenario. I can wrap both of these inward. I can wrap this one this way and this one this way, and they'll both be going toward the weld. When you're grabbing the, the wire and then twisting it, you kind of use the vertical like a lever so that you have something to twist against. Otherwise, you're just grabbing and pulling in space, and it's uh, pretty difficult. I'm gonna get one, probably not the other. And this one is just coming up a little bit short. 
so we'll just wrap it downward. The most important thing here is I don't want to break that weld. So it's by no means perfect, but here's what it looked like before, and here's what it looks like now. Another nice thing about welded wire or chicken wire is you can put it alongside a split rail fence. All you need is these galvanized staples, and you can just kind of tack it into the fence posts. At one time, my entire yard was surrounded by split rail fence, and now this is all that's left, which is why I've kind of opted for this hybrid solution for the time being. So this is pretty much a temporary fence that my wife and I installed basically in the middle of winter. We wanted something that was quick and easy to install when it was cold out, and we had pretty good success with this. We were able to run over 300 feet of fence in under two days. The ground was soft, so it went pretty quickly. But at some point, we're going to come back and we're going to make this look a lot nicer. We're going to replace these stakes with uh, permanent posts. We're going to do some nice wood trim. We'll, we'll still use the same exact material that's here now, uh, but we'll make it look a lot nicer. Another thing we didn't cover today is a gate. Currently, there is no way to get in or out of my backyard unless you have really long legs or you can jump really high. That's another thing I have some ideas for, and hopefully I'll cover that in an upcoming video as well. So if you'd like to subscribe, you'll catch those videos, plus all the other stuff that I'm working on. And also, you'll just make me feel really good because that's kind of the only reason why I do this, put the videos out there, is just so hopefully other people can enjoy them and maybe learn something from them. Speaking of which, I don't do a lot of how-to instructional type videos because most of my projects are more adventures than instruction manuals. I don't consider myself an expert on very many things, including this, um, but we had pretty good success with it and I thought other people could hopefully benefit from it. One thing I can promise you is that when I do a how-to video or an instructional type video, I will try to get right to the meat and potatoes or the plant-based protein or whatever is important to you. I won't waste a lot of your time talking up front. I'll say that to the end, kind of like now. Um, I like to keep it as short and sweet as possible so that um, you, know, you can get on with your project. Speaking of which, good luck, happy fencing, and I'll see you on the next one. Oh God, okay. This is how to install a four foot fence using five foot stakes. <laughs> you keep doing this at me, am I furrowing every time? <laughs> Making it worse. All right, this is as long as it's gonna be. <laughs>